I want to finish today thinking about the thought that we've been dwelling on over the last several weeks that today is the first day of the rest of your life. Now, I know some of you, you've kind of thought about that for years, and man, it it doesn't maybe ring as fresh to you, but there are a lot of us that are just getting a fresh understanding and a fresh revelation of this. In fact, I've had a lot of people either share with with me uh, on uh, social media or different ways going, man, that has changed my life. The recognition and the understanding that today is the first day of the rest of your life. God is a God of new beginnings. God is a God of new beginnings. In fact, here's what he says in Isaiah 43. Forget the former things. Forget the things from your past. How do you do that? Do not dwell on the past. Listen, it doesn't mean that's not going to pop in your mind, but every time it pops in your mind, quit living in the past. For some of you, it's not your past. It's your present reality because you keep thinking about it, keep dwelling on it, and you're allowing it to take you back to that moment. Have you ever... uh, uh, heard a song that you heard uh, maybe when you were dating somebody and they broke up with you and you hear that song and it takes you back there? (laughs) Me neither. But, you know, I've heard of people that that happens to. Sometimes we're allowing past things, smells, sounds, things, just connect us. The devil wants to drag us back to the past, and typically it's not an exciting thing he wants to drag us back towards. And so we've got to recognize we can't dwell on the past. When the thought pops in, go, no, no, no. God, I thank you that you're for me today. You, you, he tries to remind you of what you did wrong. Oh, God, I thank you that I'm forgiven today. God, when he begins to tell you when you made a mistake, oh, God, I thank you today that I'm more than a conqueror today. You don't dwell on the past because he goes on in the next verse and he says, see, I am doing a new thing. I'm telling you, God wants to do a new thing in every one of our lives, so we got to stop living in the past. We have to learn to live by faith. I wish the Christian life was by how you felt and what you saw. Wouldn't that be awesome? If you saw God do something, oh, now I can believe it. But it's a life of faith. It's developing your faith, growing in your faith, exercising your faith, learning more about him. God wants you to learn more about him than even just coming and showing up on Sundays. Do you know why that's so important? It is actually the way that favor increases in your life. And how many of you are thankful for the favor that you have in your life right now? Okay, I really like to see who's really excited about that. Okay, how many of you would like to see an increase of that favor in your life? I'm about to show you how Peter, the apostle, Peter, the apostle says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, grace and peace, watch this, not just be added to you, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace are going to be multiplied to you the more you begin to understand the goodness of God in your life. So we believe that God has a very specific plan and vision for your life. And so because of that as a church, we've organized ourselves around that plan and vision with a four-step process. I want to share it with you again. Some of you have heard this before, but it'll be great review. The first one is that you would know God. That's what our weekend services are all about, for you to know God. The second one is get into a small group. That's where you're going to find freedom. And just so you know, your, your question should not be, am I going to get into a group? Your question should be, how many groups am I actually going to get in this semester? Because there's some amazing, good-looking, fun-filled people that are sitting around you. In fact, just take a quick look around you and look at all the amazing people that are sitting next to you. They want to develop a relationship with you and a friendship with you. The third one is you discover your purpose. This is what happens in the growth track. You discover our purpose as a church, but you discover your purpose. And the fourth one is that we make a difference. I don't know if you know this, but God has actually called you to make a difference, to fulfill the purpose that he actually has for your life. And all four of the steps are important. All four of them are working together to lead you to be a follower of Jesus, and watch this, and a disciple of Jesus. Because we have a tendency to think Christianity is just about salvation, let me get saved, but it's not. It's about becoming a disciple. And showing up on Sundays is going to help you to learn how to know God better, to empower you, to live a life of faith. That when you feel discouraged, you're going to be able to live the victorious life of faith that God has actually called you to. Being in a small group is where we're going to do life together. We are better together. We are smarter together. We're stronger together. You're going to discover freedom You're going to discover some freedom from some past issues, some blind spots that you have that you don't see, but someone else is going to see. And they're going to lovingly help you with that. 
If they don't, you come talk to me and I'll go have a talk with them. And I will lovingly help them understand how we're going to talk lovingly to one another. So you're going to discover freedom and you're going to learn how to walk out your freedom. And then you're going to complete the growth track. And listen, go through the growth track. Listen, you can do it online. You can do it in person. Either way, but complete the growth track so that you discover your design. You'll discover that you're actually gifted. You actually are. You are a one of a kind. And when those things are happening, that's when we begin to make a difference. That's when you and I actually become followers or disciples of Jesus Christ. It's what it's all about. That's why we are constantly harping on you. No, no, we're not harping on you. That's why we are constantly reminding you. Some of you feel like we're harping on you, but we're constantly reminding you to show up on Sunday, get in a small group, go through the growth track, get involved on the dream team, make a difference, make an impact in people's lives. You were designed and created to serve. When you're making a difference, it becomes part of the process of discipleship. And and I want to help you understand this because it's not an end to itself. You don't do those four things and go, okay, I'm done. It's a process of all, doing those things every, every semester. You're, you're now back in a small group. You're showing up on Sundays every Sunday. Yeah. Every Sunday you're showing up. You're, you're, you're going through the growth track, learning what, reminding yourself what you learned in the growth track and serving on the dream team for you to know that who we are really as a body here at Amarillo Fellowship and how you fit into the body here at Amarillo Fellowship, because you've got a function, you've got a purpose here at Amarillo Fellowship, because we all have a function. We all have a role, we all have an assignment, if you will, from God. In fact, I want to show you this in Romans chapter 12. Paul is writing to the church in Rome and helping them understand this, and he says this to them in verse 4, which, by the way, I'm going to be sharing a lot of scripture today. You might want to write some of these down and kind of dig in a little bit of a theological teaching. Um, But verse 4 says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, meaning you've got a body but it has many parts. You've got a hand, you've got a foot, you've got an eyeball, an ear, different things like that. My my grandbaby's just learning this stuff, and she likes to point at it. Um, And these members do not have the same function, right? The, The foot doesn't do what the hand does. The eye doesn't do what the ear does. Watch this. So in Christ, we, talking about the body of Jesus Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are connected. It's going to go on. We have different gifts according to the grace. God's given you a grace gift given to each one of us. So again, we each have a different function and we each have a different role, but each function and each role is important. There are no small parts in the body of Jesus Christ, only small thinking. And that's why Jesus called every one of us to actually go and make disciples. Because what we kind of have a tendency to believe is, Pastor Richie, that's on you. No, my job, if you look in Ephesians chapter four, and our job as a staff is to equip the saints to actually do the work of the ministry. So God's called us in the great commission to go and make disciples. Let me show it to you in Matthew chapter 28. It says, then Jesus came to them. This is after he's resurrected. And he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Aren't you glad that when Jesus died, he restored authority back to himself and gave it to us? Therefore, watch this, go, and he's talking to all of us again, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, what a great verse and what a great reminder that God's called us to become disciples, but he's also called us to be a part of other people becoming disciples. But I think there's a couple of challenges that we kind of face when it comes to this understanding of being a disciple or making disciples. First of all, we think it's about having to be perfect and always doing it right, all right? Now, you may be the only one that does it right, but the person sitting next to you, they struggle with this from time to time. None of us do it perfect. In fact, you don't have to look very long in the Bible to where you find followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, his disciples weren't doing it right. I mean, you just look at the life of Peter, the guy who denied Jesus three times, the guy that the only time he ever took his foot out of his mouth is when he was sticking the other one in. He was constantly saying the wrong thing. Some of you know somebody like that. They're constantly saying the wrong thing. Listen, that's why it's not about perfection. It's about direction. It's about refocusing our lives all of the time. 
It's about keeping our eyes on Jesus. Again, refocusing on the abundant life that he actually has for you. Listen, and not giving up when, not if, but when you miss it. Because we're all going to miss the mark from time to time. So not giving up. You keep your eyes on Jesus. In fact, here's how the writer of Hebrews says it in Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He started and will complete the work in you. He will. You don't have to. He's going to help you. You're going to have to walk it out, but he is the one that is actually going to finish it. So discipleship is about following after him. The other challenge is we're too unsure what it's actually going to cost us. We become a little fearful. We're afraid that if we surrender our lives to Christ and become a true follower of him, then that will mean that we have to fill in the blank with your fear. The thing that you're afraid of, we'll have to quit our job. We'll have to go into full-time ministry. We'll have to act like somebody that we don't want to act like. We'll, we'll have to give all of our money to the poor, whatever it is. But remember, God has already actually hardwired you. He, he's put stuff in your DNA for a specific function. He's gifted you different than anyone else that you're sitting around. If for, he's gifted you different for the role that he actually has called you to. He's the author of your faith. He's the one who designed and created you. By the way, the word of God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't care what family said growing up. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he's the finisher of your faith. So he's going to work with you and lead you so that the completed work he's already completed will be completed in you. Amen. Are y'all picking up what I'm laying down today? This gets exciting. That's why we need to understand from God's word who our God is and who we actually are in Christ Jesus. And we need to learn how to walk out his word. Because listen, it's not enough to know that we should forgive people. We need to forgive people. It's not enough to know that we should love people. We need to actually love people. It's not enough that we know we should be kind to people. We need to be kind to people. Man, you guys are a smart group today. We've got to walk it out. We've got to walk it out so that we walk in the inheritance that Christ has actually promised for us. Some of you are praying, God, give me a great marriage, and God may be asking you today, have you, are you loving on your spouse? Are, are you being kind to them? How many of you know sometimes it's easier to be kinder to strangers at the door than it is to someone you live with? We gotta, we gotta walk in the abundant life that he actually has for us. But here's, here's the key to doing everything that I'm talking about today. If, you, if we don't get what I'm about ready to talk about, everything else seems like a duty. Everything else seems like a responsibility. Everything else seems like a have to. And, we're, and we, we get where a lot of churches, thank God it's not this church, but a lot of churches, people don't really wanna be at church. In fact, it's one of the things people tell us all the time. When people come here and visit, they say, man, it seems like people at your church actually wanna be there. And I think it's because we're getting a revelation of this. When we understand how perfectly God loves us, when we understand the price, the horrible, horrible price that he paid for us, it actually causes us to want to become a disciple. It causes us to want to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Because we're looking back going, God, if you can do that for me, you must love me. See, John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. It was his idea to send Jesus, his only son, to save us. And while Jesus was here on earth, it was his mission to explain to us and help us understand the Father's love. How perfectly God loved every one of us today. Listen, something powerful happens when you know about the love of God. But something incredible happens when you believe the love of God. And I, and I say this a lot, but I want to help us understand this. Even as believers, children of God that are going to heaven, we can be very unbelieving. We can. We can, we can just kind of lose it in a moment and forget, oh, yeah, God loves me with an everlasting love. Let me show you how Paul writes it in Romans chapter 8. He says this, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. I want to tell you, fear is not of God. Reverence is of God, fear is not of God. But you receive the spirit of adoption. Actually, sonship is a better word because the Greek word is actually the placing of a son by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. 
You didn't receive the spirit of fear. You received that spirit of sonship in your life. And so Jesus shares this parable. And all a parable is that Jesus shares is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning in Luke chapter 15 to try to help you and I understand the Father's love. And I'm praying today for every one of you that wherever you're at on this spectrum of, man, I think God's still mad at me all the way to I really believe God loves me, that you'll take your next step in growing in this revelation. Because I'm, I'm here to tell you today, we're not ever going to arrive at fully understanding how God loves us. He's an infinite God and we are finite minded. So we need to keep learning how to get the revelation of what God wants to say. So Luke chapter 15 verse 11, it says this. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And notice how it starts out that a certain man had two sons. Because in this parable, Jesus is going to liken our our heavenly father to this earthly father. Jesus is actually showing us what our heavenly father is actually like. He said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falls to me. Now catch this line because we miss this a lot of time for those of us that have heard this story a lot. So he divided to them his livelihood. I I want you to notice that it was to them. He divided his livelihood between the younger and the older brother. Because when I grew up hearing this story, I thought he just gave the portion that belonged to the younger son to him and kept all the rest. But he divided it to them. Y'all tracking with me? It's important that you hang on to that because in, in, to really understand this from Jewish culture, what the younger son was actually saying was, I cannot wait for you to die. I want my inheritance now. It's kind of like the J.G. Wentworth commercials. You know, I want my money and I want it now. That's what he's saying. So the father is being totally rejected by the younger son. But the father divided his livelihood anyway. Also in Jewish culture, when he divided it, the, the older son would actually get a double portion of what the younger son would get. Now, again, remember to hang on to that. So the younger son, many of you know the story, goes into a far-off country, wastes his possession on prodigal, wild, and riotous living. He's the prodigal son. And he basically partied all of his money away. Now a famine comes into the land, and he needs a job. He can't find a job. In fact, the only job that he can find is feeding the pigs. Again, looking at it from Jewish culture, Jewish, didn't, Jewish people did not eat pork. They didn't want to have anything to do with pigs, but this is the only job he can find, and he finds himself hungry. Let's pick up the story in verse 17. But when he came to himself, and I want to say this for those of you that are moms and dads, that you put the word of God into your children's heart, but they're not where they need to be right now. There's going to come a day when they're going to come to themselves. The word that you put in the soil of their heart is going to find fertile soil. And if you go, well, I haven't been doing that, you can start doing that now. You can start putting fertile soil in their heart by loving them, talking about God's purpose for your life and their life, the amazing plan that God has for their life. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? He says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, I want to ask you this. Based upon his response, does it seem like this younger son actually cared that he had broken his father's heart? Does it, does it seem like that he had cared that he, he had want, that his father he had hurt him and, and now he's going back because of the, the pain that he caused his father? It's not. He's going back. Why? Because he's hungry. A very practical reason. Watch this. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Man, I love, I love, 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 love talking about this dad. Can you imagine this dad rejected? He runs to him, sees him a far way off. You know what most of us would do? Did you learn your lesson? Did you learn it? Okay, go over and sit in the corner for 20 minutes and I'll talk to you in a little bit. Yeah, that's good, baby. That's good. He runs to him, still great way off, saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This guy's been in the pig pen for Pete's sake. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just so you know, he doesn't even get a chance to finish his sentence. So can I become like one of your hired servants? 
Why? Catch this. Because to become a hired servant, he would have been able to earn from his father something that his father wanted to actually give him. For us today in understanding our heavenly father, listen, God will never, ever, ever, ever let you and I earn his love, his goodness, his blessing, his favor, his peace, his health, his joy, his goodness. He'll never let us earn it. It's a free gift that he's already given to you. Just receive it. Father didn't give him a chance to try to become a servant. Watch this. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Not go take a shower and then I'll bring it out. Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Why? For this son This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. How many of you know that it's awesome to be merry? Story isn't over. Because we kind of end there. Okay, oh, the prodigal son got it right. Yeah, so man, I've been the prodigal son. Other people have been the prodigal son. They come back and get it right. Story's not over. Look at this, verse 25. Now his older son, the big brother, was in the field and he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. Notice he heard music and dancing. You know what, you wanna know that's why we call today's service a celebration service? Because in the Father's house, which is where we're at, there should be music and dancing. This shouldn't be the worst day of the week, this should be the very best day of the week. So he called one of his servants, this is the son again talking to one, so he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things, what does the music and dancing mean? Listen, I'd submit to you today that if you don't understand Christianity as a celebration, you don't understand Christianity. If you don't see Christianity as the good news of Jesus Christ, you don't get it. And it's okay. But learn to get it. Learn to understand that it's amazing. It's all this and heaven too. We get to walk in an abundant life now that when other people are freaking out, we can be calm. When other people are filled with doubt, fear, and unbelief, we can be filled with peace and joy. I know we don't do it all the time, but we can be. It's what's been provided for us. You either don't get Christianity, watch this, or you have the mindset of the older brother. Because watch this. And the servant said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fattened calf. But he, talking about the older brother, was angry and would not go in. I want you to notice that this is the first time that anyone is angry in this story. Think about that for just a moment. The father was rejected by the son. This is the first time anybody is angry. If there is anybody that should have been angry, it's the father. He's the one again that had been rejected, but he wasn't. It's the brother, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. I want you to know, even in our worst moments, God still shows up in our life and comes to us. Even when we don't get things and we're filled with doubt, fear, and unbelief, and we've got some anger issues we're dealing with, God still shows up in our life. And so he answered and said, this is the son talking, said to his father, lo, These many years I have been serving you. Sound familiar? Isn't that what the younger son wanted to do? That he he wanted to come home, but he wanted to serve. He felt like he was no longer worthy to be his son, so he wanted to serve. But the father wouldn't let him serve. Listen, why did both of these boys keep trying to earn what the father had already lavished on them? Let me put it in context for you and I. Why do you and I keep trying to earn what the Father has already lavished upon us. Why do we keep trying to perform to earn all the promises of God? Listen, I'm not saying your performance isn't important. Right behavior is good. It doesn't qualify you. It doesn't cause you to earn the goodness of God. Why do we keep trying to perform to earn something God's already given to us? Why do we continue to believe that our wrong behavior has disqualified us when our good behavior never qualified us in the first place? It's mind-blowing. And we think this story is about the wayward son or the older son, but it's really about the extravagant love of a father. It's about the extravagant love of our heavenly father. So the older son continues in verse 29, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry 
with my friends. Notice it wasn't even with his father. He said, I might make merry with my friends. It's his friends. So we, what we recognize in the son is he doesn't even have the heart of the father either. Going on in verse 30. But as soon as this son of yours came, notice he didn't say my brother. This son of yours, and I think as parents we get this. When our kids act up, that child of yours, you need to go have a child with that, talk with that child of yours, right? We, we kind of get it. They're, they're your kids. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. Watch the father's response. And he said unto him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Can you dwell on that for just a second? Remember, he divided with them the livelihood. And dad said, look, you can have more than a goat. And I want to say this for some of you that are trying to ask God for just a little tiny thing like I can barely make it to tomorrow. You can have more than a goat. You can have more than a goat. The father says, all that I have is yours. And he explains why they're celebrating. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Are you beginning to see how loving this heavenly father was? Are you beginning to see he's the main character? He's the hero of the story, even though he was rejected by the younger son. And even though the older son didn't really understand all that his dad had actually provided for him, his heart was still full of love for his sons. This is how good and loving our heavenly father is. When we begin to understand that, it compels us burn something on the inside of us and we want to follow after him. We want to become a disciple of his. Now listen, we still wrestle with the flesh. You're still going to have some doubt, fear, and unbelief. You're going to lose focus from time to time. But man, I'm telling you, when you remind yourself and you recognize how good your God is, you'll start walking in the revelation of God's perfect love. And what will happen is you'll quit trying to stop quit trying to fit God into your life and you'll make him the center of your life and you'll want to follow after him. You'll want to be a disciple. Teach me how to be more like you. I want to walk in everything that you have for me. And I know for every one of us, there are things that happen in our life that challenge the revelation of God's love, but it's how we respond in our heart to the things that we actually don't understand. Because how many of you have recognized there's just some things you don't understand? Some things that have happened in your past, some things that are going on in your life right now you just don't understand. But it's the revelation of how you stunned that really is the greatest revelation of where you're actually at in understanding just how much the Father actually loves you today. So my question is, are you allowing the circumstances in the situations of your life to determine your belief in God's love? Or in the midst of all of the storms, in the midst of the crazy that's going on around you, are you making a decision? I'm just going to remain steady. I'm going to remain steadfast. Man, the, the devil keeps wanting me to look over here at all these problems, but man, I'm going to look straight ahead. Are you learning to rest in the arms of your loving Heavenly Father? Going, God, I, I don't get COVID. God, I don't get financial setback. I don't get loss. But God, I know you're good. And I know everything I'm going through, I'm going through. I'm going to come out the other side victorious. And God, my confidence is in you today. Because God, even if I am absent from the body, I am present with the Lord today. And I know that you're good. Here's the the point of the whole message. If we ever get a revelation, and by the way, it's ongoing again, of how perfectly God loves you. And again, let me remind you, today is the first day of the rest of your life. So you can start today. It doesn't matter if you didn't get it in the past. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. You will want to follow him. You will, and you'll do everything you can to do the things I was talking about. You'll show up on Sundays as often as you can. You'll get into a small group. You'll go through the growth track. You'll get on the dream team. You're going, man, my life's got purpose. My life's got destiny. God, you did all of that for me. Thank you. You'll follow after him. So listen to this. Whether it's you're the wayward son, you find yourself in that camp all the time, find yourself drifting from God, and you always seem like you're losing your way, or you're the older son, and you think because of following all the rules that you've actually kind of earned something, that you kind of earned the favor of God. Every one of us, all we need to do is we have to open up our heart, open up our life to God and receive God's love and allow his love to cause you to fall in love with him so that you follow after Jesus. Listen, it's really not about our love for him. 
I've noticed through the years as we sing songs about like, I love you, Lord. Boy, we can sing it out with a lot of confidence. But when we sing songs about God loving us, we kind of lose our confidence sometimes. Because we're really not sure. But listen, it really isn't about us loving God. We should love God. But it really is about Him loving us. In fact, let me show you from the scripture, 1 John 4. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the payment for our sin. If you drop down a few verses to verse 19, it says, we love Him because He first loved us. See, our love is just a response. If you want to learn how to love people that are unlovable, recognize how perfectly God loves you in your unlovable moments, suddenly you can love everybody. In fact, one of the litmus tests in my life I can tell when I'm not understanding the love of God is my love for other people begins to grow a little faint. And I have to refocus my life. We have to learn how to fully believe in the perfect love of God and fully receive the perfect love. To recognize that you are qualified, not because of your behavior, but because of Jesus today. Embrace the love of God today. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes and remind you, today is the first day of the rest of your life. You don't have to leave here the same today. And I want to pray for people that are here today, two groups. I want to pray for those of you, first of all, that you feel like the wayward son. You feel like you've disappointed God too much. You've gone too far. You went too far and God doesn't love you. I want you to know God loves you today. But I also want to pray for those of you that are like the older son. You think that you've earned it. You think that you deserve it. And you you don't understand some things. And I want to believe God with you today that you'll embrace and understand and receive the love that God has for you. So, Lord, I pray for every one of us once again today. Every one of us are on a journey to understand and embrace the love of God. And I pray, Lord, if our, if our love has grown cold, we would recognize it's simply because we haven't been receiving the love that you have for us. And so I pray today, Lord, whether, whether we feel like that wayward son, and we feel like we're always disappointing you, or we feel like that, that older son, and we feel like we, we've kind of earned and deserved something, and we feel cold and distant from you today, God, that we would embrace your love once again that we'd recognize in this is love, not that we love God, but that you loved us and sent your son to be the payment for us today. So Lord, I just thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in our hearts and lives. And God, it's not about perfection, it's about direction. It's about refocusing our hearts and lives to believe and receive your goodness today. So God, I pray right now, silence every accusation and lie of the enemy. Let people believe and receive your promises today. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, as you guys know, we don't ever like to end a service without giving people an opportunity to give their life to Christ. And if you're here today and you've never received the love of God into your heart and life, you've never given your life to Christ, or you're watching online and and you've never received the love of God into your life, I want to lead you in a simple prayer right there at your seat or right there in your living room or wherever you're watching for you to receive Christ into your life. But I also want to include in this prayer, those of you that you're here today going, Pastor Richie, I'm not where I need to be. I prayed a prayer once, but I'm not where I need to be. And I'd like to rededicate my life. To, I'd like to include you in that prayer also. So I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, if you're here or you're online, just by, by an act of faith, I'm going to ask you to shoot your hand up high, hold it up high for just a moment, because I want to see you. I want to pray for you. One, two, three. Right where you're at, just slip it up. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am, right here. God bless you in the back. God bless you right up here. God bless you, young man. Anybody else as I look across the audience? God, God bless you, young lady. God's dealing with your heart. Anybody else right where you're at? Yep, God bless you right back here. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, whether you're online or here today, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm going to invite everyone that's here today or online to just pray this prayer out loud after me. Just say, Dear Jesus, Thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming and explaining to me the love of the Father. I believe in you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again, that I might have life, abundant life, and eternal life. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your unconditional love for me. It's in Christ's name I pray. 
Amen.